Everything pretty good, Piet? Everything good? Okay. Uh, I know we prayed, but he just turned that on. So I'd like to, for the Zoomers that are on, at least have a word of prayer for them. So let's go ahead and pray. Then I'll get right into the message. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd forgive me for my sins tonight, Lord. Congregation as well, covers with your blood. I pray that you bless your word, bless the sermon. May Jesus Christ be exalted and magnified. Lord, let us, uh, let us just do thy will, serve you with a pure heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15. <clears throat> As I continue my trek through the read your Bible in a year, I'm coming across a lot of good stuff. And I know a lot of the sermons have been coming out of the Old Testament. Um, as the Lord gives me, and I pray that his will always be done, I'll bring forth whatever the Lord gives me to give to you. Um, Book of Deuteronomy has been a blessing to me. I believe it to be uh, one of the greatest books in the Old Testament. It just, it's a reminder to the people of God to stay steadfast, to not quit, to when God gives you all the blessings that you get in life to Israel and God established them, basically. He told them, once you get in the land and you're established and I give you bread enough to eat and I give you the land and I give you all the good things, don't forget me. That's the whole lesson of the book of Deuteronomy. Don't forget me. And don't forget to tell your children about me. And if we took that lesson and we applied that to us, what type of people would we be? What type of country would we have? Don't forget me. And don't forget to tell your kids. And don't forget to be a good testimony to your children. But in reading Deuteronomy, you get little nuggets there. And I got a good nugget. I got a good nugget that explains, you know, kind of I did on Sunday with Achan. Now, a lot of people would say, well, why did God kill Achan? And, and, and why did he have his whole family killed? And I explained to you from the scripture that it boiled down to Achan robbing God. Now, there comes another chapter in the Bible in 1 Samuel. Here we are where the Lord gives a command to Saul and he tells him, I want you to go and I want you to wipe out the Amalekites. I want you to wipe out them and everything that belongeth to them. Now, when you think about that command, God's going to wipe out a whole people. And you say, well, why would God do that? God has memory, doesn't he? And God never forgets. And God didn't forget what they did to his children when they were weak and feeble. And remember this, the ways of God are way beyond us. What's the scripture say about God's thoughts? My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways, your ways, saith the Lord. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, saith the Lord. As for God, his way is perfect. In God is no sin. What God chooses to do, God could justify to anybody. But he doesn't have to. Remember this. The earth that we're on right now doesn't belong to us. It was given to man and told to have dominion. But in the end, Whose earth is it? Heaven is the Lord's throne. And the earth is his footstool. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God can do with his creation and with his earth anything he chooses to do. Shall the thing formed say unto the thing that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? We should be content with the way we're made. We should be content with the gifts we have. We should be content with everything we have. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For it is certain that she brought nothing into the world. And you can't carry anything out either. As you came in, you're going to go out. 
God doesn't have to justify what he does, but yet at the same time, he gives us reason why he tells Saul to do this. And it's long before chapter 15. It's working up to this that God finds a time in the nation of Israel that they're strong enough to do this. They just got a king, and God's going to try the king. And God's going to see if you're going to be obedient to me. This is the first king of Israel, and his name is Saul. And he was a goodly man. Head and shoulders stood he above the people. God said, go do this. I want you to do what I tell you to do and fulfill it. And I think in life, when we think of what God tells us to do, all we have to do is do what he tells us to do. Some of it may be hard, but when God tells us to do something and we know it comes from God, we should fulfill what he wants us to do all the way through. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Now Saul had no idea what Samuel was going to tell him, but this was going to be a test. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go, smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. God doesn't leave anything, does he? He says, go, destroy it all. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 footmen, and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Okay, now before we go on here, I want to go through what, he, what Amalek did to Israel and why God was so infuriated with the actions of Amalek and why all of this happens in chapter 15 is because God waits for the perfect opportunity to bring judgment on the people of Amalek, Amalek and the Amalekites, for what they did to Israel long before this. Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. We're going to come here in a, in a few passages, but let's go to Exodus 17. We'll come back uh, to 1 Samuel in a little while. Exodus 17, verse 8. If you're looking for it, I'll give you all the scripture in regard to Amalek. So you can write these down so you have it moving forward. So when you get to 1 Samuel 15, if anybody would ever question you and say, why did God do this? You'll be completely prepared to give an answer. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Okay, now if you look, this is early in the nation of Israel here, 17. They just came out of Egypt just a couple chapters before, didn't they? If you look in chapter 15, chapter 14, in verse 31, it tells you, And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared God and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And chapter 14 ends with them coming out uh, across the Red Sea. Chapter 15, Moses sings the song, okay, of deliverance. And then we go to chapter 16, and we get chapter 17. And all of a sudden, when the people haven't learned war, and they're not prepared for this, Amalek comes out against them to fight. And this is what God remembers. And Moses said unto Joshua, chapter 17, verse 9, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now understand this. They didn't know what war was. They just came through. Remember when the Egyptians came upon them, they started to cry out to God, right? And against Moses saying, why have you brought us out of here to die? Now, granted, they might have had a lot of men, but did they really have weapons? Were they established? No, they're just a new nation that's trying to find themselves coming through. God's with them, of course. But Amalek, 
the Amalekites take complete advantage of the children of Israel and come upon them when they're weak, their forces aren't strong, and wage war against them. And this is what really angers God, because most of the other people at that time were letting them come through, but not Amalek. Amalek withstood them right there. This was a big time challenge in the life of the Israelites. They didn't know how to make war. No general was proven. No soldier was proven. They were just coming out of slavery. These guys didn't know what to fight. 430 years in Egypt? Did they ever wage war? Weren't they very vulnerable? Well, so when you think about why did God tell Saul to do this, because God remembered. He remembered. Now watch. So we get here. This is why this battle is really impressive here that they win. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So again, I do this all the time and I can't hold my hands up that long and I can hold them up, but I can't hold them up all day, can I? After a while, my hands would get very, very heavy and I wouldn't be able to hold them up at all. And as they go down, Israel loses. As they go up, Israel wins, okay? So he gets some help. 12, but Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on it, Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. The one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial. What's a memorial? We celebrate Memorial Day. What do we do on Memorial Day? We remember who? Fallen. The ones who died in battle. Memorial. He says, write this down for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. This really angers the Lord. And he says, put it down, write it down. I will utterly put out the remembrance of them from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So you can see right there, Amalek becomes the enemy of God and the enemy of the people of God. They established it. Who drew first blood? The Amalekites. And it was a direct attack against God's people. Therefore, a direct attack against God. And God was going to fight for Israel. He said he would. He would be their commander. He would fight for them. The Lord would fight for you. As Moses said, hold your peace, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. Okay, now let's go over to Numbers. This goes a little further. Numbers chapter 24. Numbers 24. God associates Amalek with Balaam. With Balaam, okay? Remember, this is early in the beginning of the nation of Israel. So these people that did these things were early in the beginning. Achan was early. First battle, Jericho. He robbed God. God said, destroy him. Amalek came upon them when they were feeble. God says, I'll remember him. What did Balaam do? Same chapter here. Balaam teaches Balak, okay, through Baal. There's your satanic trinity. Baal, Balak, Balaam, all bees, okay, associated together. That's your satanic tri tri uh, trinity right there in that, in that verse. They mentioned all three together. What did they do together? Well, Balaam teaches Balak through Baal cast a stumbling block for the nation of Israel. He teaches them how to worship false gods. The reason God destroys Balaam and has Balaam killed is because Balaam puts a stumbling and causes, he teaches Balak how to put a stumbling block before the nation of Israel and he causes them to intermarry with them, thus defiling the seed. And who's the deliverer Anybody know him? God says, you, buddy, you're going to go down in history. I'll always remember what you did. 
He took a javelin, didn't he? What was his name? His name was Phineas. He took a javelin and he went into the tent where man and woman were. And they were doing this openly right there in the sight of all Israel. Just disregarding the commandment of God, fornicating. And he took a javelin and he threw, put it through both of them. Right, the one man through the belly and the woman through her belly, right through them. And God says, you're to be praised for this. He said, but that's violent, pastor. That's very violent. These people caused the nation of Israel to begin to go sour. God remembered all this. And it was very, at the very beginning of the onset of this nation, they were getting established. God wanted them to be established in righteousness. And everybody who went against them at the beginning, God holds fierce judgment against them. Amalek was the other one. Balaam, Amalek, Achan, and the ones that I said. So now we get to Numbers 24, and you can see in verse number one, Balaam saw. Okay, Balaam. Verse two, Balaam. Balak comes in here. Verse 10, Balak. Okay, so in the same chapter, uh, Numbers 24, we get down to verse 20. And when he looked on Amalek, now all of a sudden, Amalek pops up here. He took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. So a little prophecy regarding Amalek. He was the first of the nations, but he said his end, he's going to perish forever. Okay. Let's look in Deuteronomy, where I was reading the other night, other night. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25. Let's look in verse 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way. When ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. So while they were wandering out there and trying to collect themselves as they were marching through, Amalek come behind them and attacked them, and he smote all the feeble ones. And those that were in the back, he smote them. God says, I remember what he did. I saw it. And I remember it. And I'll never forget what he did. And I want you to put the remembrance of him under heaven. He's to perish forever. Now, God didn't tell Moses to do it. God was going to wait for the perfect opportunity. And it wasn't with Joshua either. The forces under Joshua were developing and getting strong. But when they got their king, God said, now's the time. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 18, or verse 19, Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest. See? He says, hold on, can't do it now, when I give you rest. Lord hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, Thou shalt not forget it. So he tells them, don't forget this. When I establish you, I put you in your land and I give you rest. And that's exactly what happened with Saul. Established the king. The kingdom got, the kingdom got built. The king had his army. They were at rest. And God says, now I remember. And you should remember as well. I told you to not forget this. I want you to go and I want you to smite Amalek. You see why the command Samuel gave to Saul was so important? God was building up. And his anger, his anger hadn't been satisfied. And judgment was going to come on Amalek. Okay, now we got one more passage before we can go to 1 Samuel again. We got to go to Judges. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. The Lord re reminded them in Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then Judges again, Judges chapter 3.
It says, Judges chapter 3, verse 12, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. What do you know about him? Eglon. Sunday school kids all know this story. If you've been in Sunday school, you heard this story. Eglon was the, he was the king of Moab, but what was unique about him? He is very fat. He was very fat, very large. And he went in to sleep in his summer parlor. And didn't somebody have an errand to bring to him? What was his name? Ehud. Ehud had a gift. And he told the men who guarded the summer parlor there, he said, uh, I, I have an errand. It's for the king. I have a gift, an errand. And they said, oh, okay, go in. They went in and the king said, what do you have? And what did he have for him? He had a dagger. And he took that dagger and he thrust it into him. And the Bible says that what happened? The dagger went in. And the dagger never came out. And the collops of fat engulfed the dagger. And give me my dagger back. Oh, well. He tucked them back in bed, didn't he? And he covered them over. And he went out. And his servants thought he was just sleeping in there. Well, he was sleeping all right. He was deader than a hammer. Took and he killed him, didn't he? Okay, well, in the same passage, that judgment goes against Eglon. God mentions Amalek again. He just can't seem to forget this. These people, Amalek. Okay, watch. It says in verse 13, And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon, and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm tree. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So he joined forces with Amalek, God's perpetual enemy. Okay, so you can see again, it's building up here. Now the king comes, and this is the perfect time. 1 Samuel 15. So I led up to all that. We'll go back to 1 Samuel chapter 15. So now when we read it, you'll understand why the Lord wants them all dead. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 6. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel. So you see God's memory? Amalek did not show kindness. The Kenites did. So they were spared. You showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. He did good, didn't he? By doing what the Lord told him to do. Now, watch what happens. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now, God said to kill them all. I don't know what his intention was in keeping Agag alive. Maybe it was to kill him in front of all the people. I don't know. Maybe he had a noble reason. But what he does next is not what he was told to do. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and will not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed 
the commandment of the Lord. Did he? He said, I've done it. I've performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? How you perform it? What means this bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen? Where did all these animals come from? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. He said, well, we kept the best. You know, God wants a sacrifice. Was God interested in that sacrifice? See, when God tells you to do something, God's not interested in us going halfway. And oftentimes we compromise. Well, I'll do this, Lord, if. Or I'll go halfway, but I can't. I'm not going to do that. Is God pleased with that? When God says to do something, what should we do? We should do what he says all the way. All the way. God says, do it, do it. He told them to do it. Okay, now let's keep going. It says in verse 16, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen. Who's in charge? Saul. Saul's in charge, but the people took of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Samuel says these famous words to him here. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Oftentimes we think we can, we can uh, well, I'll do this and God will be satisfied with this. God didn't tell you to do that. God told you to do this. So why offer to do this? When God says to do this, do this. Right. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man, and he should repent. So because of this, he doesn't follow through. Now this, in the end, this count right here. God is so upset with Saul over this that he remembers it and it ends up costing Saul his life. This event. You say, man, see God remembered and God says, do what I tell you to do. Saul didn't do it. And God said, because of this I'm going to remember what you did. And God ends up bringing a curse upon Saul because of this. Let's go to 1 Samuel 28. When he goes to the witch of Endor, this is something God brings up through Samuel and a reminder. 1 Samuel chapter 28. 
1 Samuel 28. First Samuel 28, he goes to the witch and he wants the witch of Endor to bring up Samuel. And she does. First Samuel 28, verse 11, then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul saying, why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? To bring me up. See, she obviously brought him up. Some may say, well, it looked like Samuel, or it was an appearance. No, it looked like this was Samuel. And God let him see. I believe that in the Old Testament, when somebody died, they went into a state of soul sleep there in the Old Testament. This is why when Lazarus goes into Abraham's bosom, it's Abraham who answers the rich man in Luke chapter 16. And the rich man says to Abraham, send Lazarus, that he may dip tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. And it's not Lazarus that speaks. And Abraham says, behold, now he is comforted. Thou art tormented. So I personally believe that from the beginning of time up to the time of the resurrection, that those that went to paradise were in a state of soul sleep, except for Abraham because this was Abraham's bosom. They were resting in his bosom, and he did all the talking. And that seems to lend itself here. Samuel's there, and the witch brings him up, and obviously the Lord says to Samuel, hey, wake up. You're needed one more time. And Abraham, maybe, or whomever, go. And he comes up, and there he appears. And when the witch sees him, she goes... <laughs> She was even shocked, huh? She was shocked because this was the real deal. You know, normally when she did this kind of stuff, it was a spirit or something like that. This was, this was him. And she knew from him that this was Saul. And that angers God. It's Samuel that lays judgment, that passes judgment down there in 1 Samuel. And here... God's not answering Saul at all. He tries to go through multiple means and God won't answer him. So he pulls Samuel up from the dead. Think about that. How far Saul fell when he was first called to be king. They reckoned Saul among the prophets. But through disobedience, God said, done with you. I'm going to give your kingdom to a neighbor who's better than you. And he gave that kingdom to David. It just goes to show we can start out great for God, can't we? But we can make a mess of things. We need to be careful that we always obey God. And how many Christians tonight are away from God because of disobedience? They just refuse to obey or they want to do things their own way. Where will our way lead? Sometimes we think we know better than God, don't we? Can we tell the future? But he can. Why don't we just trust him? Let him lead. Watch what happens. We're going to be closed with this passage. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, 
thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from me, and is become thine enemy? Was God on his side at one time? Now he's his enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Why? Why do you do that? Look in 18. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee. God remembered it all the way to the end. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. What was going to happen to him the next day? Where was Samuel? He was dead, wasn't he? And he said, tomorrow, you and your son, God's going to lay judgment down upon you. And tomorrow, you're going to be with me. God was going to kill him. And indeed, they did die. The Philistines got him. And they killed him. What an ending to a man who started off so well, all because he didn't obey the voice of the Lord. God says to obey is better than sacrifice. You can offer all day long. God says, I don't want those things. You can offer up everything. I don't want that. I said to do this. When we do that, what God tells us to do, there we'll be blessed. Then we'll be blessed. Okay, we're going to go to prayer.